Hello and welcome back to the channel. I really do appreciate you dropping in, and if you enjoy my content, don't forget to leave a like, subscribe, share it with all your friends, and all that stuff. And if you missed my last video, I did post a new video, and some of those stories in there are absolutely insane. The only real way you would have seen those twists coming is if you already knew about the stories. So if you missed that, go ahead and check that video out after this one. But first, today's video is sponsored by MyHeritage. MyHeritage is the leading global service for family history research and DNA testing. It's as easy as receiving your package, following the directions that are in there, essentially you just take a cotton swab and swab the inside of your mouth for about 30 seconds to a minute, and do the same thing with the other cheek. Once you're done, you take the Q-tip and you put it in this little vial, and then you break the tip off, seal it up, package it up all proper, and mail it back out. Then you wait probably two to three weeks and get your results. All right, so my results are finally in. Let's check it out. You are 25.6 Iberian. Percent Iberian. 18.6 Scandinavian. Okay, so 25%, just over 25% Iberian. I mean, there's some Greek, East European, West Asian, Mexico. Mexico. Let's see if my DNA matches. See if I have any DNA matches. Who is that? That might be my brother. I think that's my dad. And I think that's my brother. I think I found a brother. I think I found a brother. If you're trying to learn some more about yourself as well as your family, get MyHeritage today and get that test going. And not only can you see your ancestry and relatives and all that stuff, but you can complete your own family tree by adding in the names. And you can also upload pictures. And you can colorize, fix, and enhance the pictures in case you have older ones. And if you want to possibly find some of your hidden relatives, once again make sure to click that link in the description or in the pinned comment and use code YOURMAKER for 50% off your first year subscription, 30 day free trial, and free shipping. I want to give a huge shout out to MyHeritage for partnering and sponsoring this video. And without any further ado, let's begin. Henry Long, Albert Bowers, and Jesse Colt were traveling 18-year-olds who got by in life by robbing people. Between them, they had expansive criminal records including robbery, battery, and sexual assault. Albert was known for his passion for blood sport and was a racist. Henry Long started thieving when he was only 12 years old, and Jesse was a tree cutter but often went thieving with Albert and Henry. On August 15, 2020, while in the village of Bradfield Southend, they came across a quad bike parked at a house belonging to Peter Wallace. They agreed to return to steal it later, which they did at 11 at night. They wore face masks and gloves that night. But as they were stealing the quad bike, Peter saw them and dialed 999. Thames Valley Police, what's your emergency? Uh, I've got four masked men outside my house and they've got weapons. They came around earlier and now they're in my ha they're at my property in Stamford. And what Dingley. weapons have they got? Um, handheld things. They're all masked. And um, what's your name? Peter Wallace. And your postcode? RG76JP. And what number are you? I'm at Privet House. It's uh. It's not a number, it's a... Privet House. Privet House, yeah. yeah. And what weapons did you say? I, I saw them handheld things a, a moment ago. I don't know whether they're coming to break in this house. I don't know whether they're coming, but they're... Yeah, can you please send some... Someone, are they trying to get into your property? They're, they are gone to break into something. They're getting into, trying to get into my garage or, or something. Is that them I can hear in the background? No, that's me shuffling about, trying to see them. And when did you see them before? Well, I saw them before at five o'clock, but that's, uh, they, they come back in a different car, I presume. And what do you think the weapons were? Oh, just hand, uh, well, a handheld piece of wood or something. But uh, I think they're just breaking into my garage to nick my stuff, eh? And they're quite threatening outside. I presume they know I'm in here. Can you get the registration number? I've got GK53, I thought, but uh, they and came in another. And when you said masks, are they. Got, hey? Masks, what do you mean? Are they well, faces they, covered? They've got, 
so yeah, they've got their faces covered, gloves on, hats on. Are you at home alone? Yeah. Oh, and they're stealing my squad bike. I'm going out there now. No, no, don't go out there. I'm going out there now. No, because if they've got weapons... Yeah, I don't care. I've got to protect that bike. They're taking the squad bike. No, nope. your safety is important. Stay in your property. Please send someone. I'm going Someone's out on there. their way. No, no, don't go out there. Have you sent someone or not? Officers are on their way. But you can't go out there. I'm going If they've out. got a weapon, then you'll, you'll be hurt. Well, there's all sorts of bits of wood out there. They could pick up anything, but they're not taking my van by. <laughs> you need to stay in your property. That means I've already taken it. Have you, does it have a registration number? Peter, do that, does your bike have no, a registration number? No, they tried to take the bike. They can't take it. They're going, I think. Can you oh, see their vehicle? No, uh, I don't know what they're doing. They're going to fucking come in here and ram the fucking car. Peter started to think he may have to take them on, the entire band of thieves. But he ended up watching them tow his quad bike away since the operator convinced him that there were respondents close by. The respondents were Andrew Harper and Andrew Shaw, who both heard of the burglary on the radio while they were merely some minutes away in an undercover police car. Just as they arrived, the robbers were trying to get away. When they realized the police had arrived, they decided to unhook the quad bike and make a run for it. One of the robbers was on the quad bike, then ran past the police undercover car to get back into the getaway vehicle. Andrew Harper immediately got out of the car to go after him. When Shaw turned to look at his partner chasing one of the thieves, he saw Harper fall backward and heard his head smack the ground. What had happened was Harper's legs got caught in the loading strap the robbers were towing the quad bike with. Harper was dragged along on the road for over a mile as the robbers escaped Shaw who was giving chase far behind. Knowing full well they were dragging Harper along on the road and with music blaring in the car, Henry who was driving started to turn the car left and right. Shaw had no idea what happened to Harper. He was far behind but came across Harper's bloody vest on the road. Shortly after, another officer observed a body that looked like a deer carcass in the road and radioed it in. By the time Harper was free from the robber's car, his body was unrecognizable. During the trial that followed, the robbers claimed they had no idea they were dragging Harper behind them. They admitted they wanted to steal the quad bike, but didn't intend to hurt Harper. And yet, during the trial, they laughed when Harper's horrifying end was described to the jury. Henry even said right after getting arrested that he did not care that Harper died. In fact, Henry was so proud of escaping the police in a car that in his alibi he claimed that he was watching Fast and Furious. Additionally, during the investigation, friends and families of the thieves tried to interfere with the police work. There were also reports that the jury was being targeted. It was a great disappointment to Harper's wife, family, and friends when none of the defendants were convicted of murder, with only two of them being found guilty of manslaughter, which holds a considerably smaller sentence. The only people who cheered were the families of the thieves. Robert Serqua was with his identical twin brother Christopher in their family home in Hythe, Hampshire. It was New Year's Eve 2013 and their parents Pete and Denise were upstairs. Apart from just growing up together, they also had worked together in the building trade. They were on friendly terms, but their relationship sometimes turned violent when they drank. Robert had a criminal past. He had served time for domestic violence as well as criminal damage. Up till about 7 p.m. on New Year's Eve, he was in a good mood, messaging his girlfriend, Joelle Mansfield, about how he was excited to marry her. But then an argument broke out with Christopher, and he sent her a message suggesting it had something to do with their past and that they had to get things sorted out. An hour later, he was already telling her about a fight breaking out, adding that he had no choice in the matter. They wound up fighting, and Robert stabbed Christopher with a kitchen knife. He then fled the house shoeless to join his girlfriend at a New Year's Eve party and switched his phone off so that nobody could contact him. 
While the fight had been escalating, his mother, Denise, called 999. Police tracked Robert down to a nearby party at 2.20 a.m. and arrested him. He fell asleep in the car on the way to the police station, and after waking up, he asked the officers if his brother really was dead. In interviews that followed, Robert claimed that his brother was the first to hold the knife, and that his life was under threat. The police had recovered the kitchen knife from the sink in the kitchen. It was bent and had blood on it, but since Robert and Christopher were twins, their DNAs were similar which was a setback for authorities. Despite his claims of self-defense, Robert was still convicted of murder for killing his brother. Robert must serve a minimum of 13 years in prison. Twenty-three-year-old Madog Rollins and 21-year-old Lauren Griffins were engaged to be married in 2019, four years after they had first met. They had a tough relationship, full of ups and downs. In 2018, they were both dealing with issues. Lauren with mental health issues such as dissociative disorder, worsened by a past of dealing with abuse, including from an ex-boyfriend. As for a dog who was raised as a pagan, his troubles were financial. Due to the problems they were each facing in their lives, a year before they were engaged, dog suggested they enter a suicide pact together. However, Lauren backed out of the agreement after her life started to turn around and she started to become happier. To her dismay, Madog was persistent. Lauren even had to seek protection from her friends from Madog during this period. In March 2019, Madog strangled Lauren in front of her friend out of anger that she had backed out of their suicide pact. Thankfully, her friend called the police. 
Throughout their relationship, Lauren would go on to share the same pagan beliefs as my dog. They would also use drugs such as LSD and MDMA recreationally, and their friends thought of them as inseparable since my dog was possessive and controlling when it came to Lauren. What's worse is my dog was never able to let go of Lauren backing out of the suicide pact. In April 2019, he finally exacted his revenge, shortly before they were to be married. He strangled her again, this time to death, then wrapped her body in cling film. What he did after was surprising. Right next to his fiancée's corpse, my dog ordered pizza and tried to set up a Netflix account. It wasn't until 35 hours later that he finally dialed 999. Are you the patient? Yeah. All right. Tell me exactly what's happened. I've killed my my fiance by mistake. Pardon? I've... But are you the patient, sir? Yes. Okay, so you said you're the patient. Yes. Right, okay. Right, tell me exactly what's happened to your fiance. She's dead. Right, how is she dead? Because I've I've killed her. Right. Right, how have you killed her, sir? I I, I strangled her. To make an 86 and statements off you guys yeah. anyway. Step up down here. Yeah, if you don't mind, thank you. Obviously, what's happened has happened. The ambulance staff have told us what's happened. Okay? Everything I'm saying now is being recorded. Alright? But at the moment, I am arresting you, okay, on suspicion of murder. You do not have to say anything, it may harm your defence if you do not mention when question something which is later on in court. Anything do say may be given in evidence. Okay? Alright? So you're under caution now. That means everything that you say and do from this point onwards, I will record and I will write down. Alright? Yeah. Okay. We're going to be taking you down to the police station now. I advise you at the moment not to talk to me or anything, unless it's anything to do with your welfare at the moment. Have you been arrested before by the police? You have. Okay, and what was that for? For, um... For attacking Lauren. Right. Okay. And what happened that time? Uh, it was strangling again. Right. The authorities arrested my dog. While they were at his house, they found a note on the wall that read, Now that I have killed her, this will be my plan. To keep her sexy from the outside, I'll wrap her in plastic. My dog had written another note on paper stating that he also tried to kill himself after murdering Lauren. The evidence against him continued to mount. On his computer, there were searches on how to achieve the best results in court and how to show remorse. Regardless of all this, he maintained that he killed Lauren in self-defense. He even said that he lost consciousness while strangling her and mistakenly killed her. However, experts during the trial stated that that is not possible. The jury found him guilty of murder and the judge sentenced him to life in prison. On July 1, 2020, Damien Barry hosted Lindsay Harkin, also known as Joey, and Rachel Walsh at his home on Lower Holland Bank Street in Blackburn. Joey had left Northern Ireland to start a new life in England in 2016, but after failing to get a job, he lost his home and started taking drugs. He also had a criminal history. At just 19, he was sent to prison for grievous bodily harm. His later convictions include robbery and battery. On that day, Damien, being generous, gave Joey clothes and food. However, after taking drugs and drinking alcohol, Joey robbed Damien, taking 55 pounds and his bank card. He then stabbed Damien several times with a kitchen knife. He also slashed Damien's throat. Damien, still losing blood and covered in it, went out to look for help. He fell on the pavement before a neighbor found him and called 999. Yeah. Put that around your neck and hold it there. Don't move. Uh -huh. 
I'm going to die. Sit down. Sit down. Can you hear me? My mate's just, yeah, I can hear you. My mate's just been stabbed. He's so he's so on the clip. I'm leaving out. He, he, he's bleeding out. I need an ambulance straight away. Right. And police. Listen, just calm down. Oh. I need to know where you are. Four Holland Bank Street. Blackburn. I'm holding this guy's neck to stop him from bleeding to death. Right, just hold the lamb while I get help on the uh. way. Thank you very much. Just Today, I'm, I'm not, I'm gonna die. You're not gonna die. I'm leaving you in the world of hope. I'm harmed. You stabbed me in my neck and everything. Christ. I'm gonna die. You're not gonna die. I'm gonna make sure you, you don't die. Listen, listen, I'm I've got to bring the ambulance and the police on the way, okay? Thank you. Oh, thank you. you. Thank you. Stay don't worry the about the blood. Stay on just the phone. Stay there. Right, nice one. It's coming out of Don't worry about it. Just keep it there. Please. I'm going to save you, mate. Is it? I'm going to die. You're not going to die. Hurry up, love. Please. It's all right. Listen, me being on the top. Listen, it's not He's too late. He's got blood everywhere. He's Please. just had his throat slit. Yeah, just listen to me. Right. Please. The police and the ambulance are already on route. We're not delaying anything. But Please. I need to know. Thank you very much. Listen, I need to know. Thank you. Please. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Stop him right. breathing. Calm down. I'm going to die. You're not going to die. Calm down. I'm going to pass out. Who stabbed him? They just stabbed him. They slit his throat. He's standing outside my gate while I was lying down now. And they stabbed him in his back. I've got blood all over there, all over the street outside. Do you know where you're from? Yeah, I'm going to be quick. I'm going to die. Uh, he's starting to pass out. Thankfully, Damien survived the horrific attack. But after returning home from the hospital, he started living in constant fear that he would be stabbed again. Hence, he moved away from Blackburn. Still, he suffers from PTSD and no longer trusts people easily. During his trial, Joey's defense spoke about his background, starting with his father being jailed when he was young to his own criminal record, and stated that Joey wanted to break the cycle of violence and crime that was ruling his life. Joey was sentenced to nine years in prison. Jason and Stacy White were married for 10 years and had a daughter together. But in 2017, their relationship took a turn for the worst. Jason had come across cigarette butts in their home that he believed were left behind by a man. Jason became consumed by his thoughts of his wife's infidelity. His suspicions were backed by calls and messages on Stacy's phone. They fought over Jason's allegations for a couple of months. He even thought about ending his own life, but could not go through with it. That same morning, however, he resolved to end Stacy's life instead. They had both woken up about 6 a.m. to smoke together before Stacy went back to sleep. That's when Jason got a gun, barricaded his daughter's door, and began smoking another cigarette. He then went into their bedroom, covered her head with a pillow, and fired. After murdering his wife, Jason messaged his father asking him to come by and pick up their daughter. His father then dialed 911 to report Jason. Lakewood Police. Hello? Lakewood Police. Yes, hello. Yes. Uh, uh, I just left my son's house with my granddaughter. He just shot his wife. What? He just shot his wife. Um, I've got my granddaughter. I'm taking her to my wife's house. I'm coming back. It's, he's there. He's got a gun. Hello? Hold on one second. Yeah, we're going to grandma's. Okay. Ooh, is, where is the wife now? The wife is in the basement with, the, with my son. Okay, why why did he shoot him? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I, he left me a love, big long text message and told me to come get my granddaughter. I did that. Okay. I'm taking her to my house right now. Okay, did you where are you now? Right now I'm on, on Franklin and Cohasset. Okay. Did you see your what, son's wife? She, no, she was laying in a bed and she was covered with a blanket. Okay. Do you know when this happened? No, I don't. Okay. I, just, I just woke up and checked my phone. 
Okay, how old is your granddaughter? She'll be three in May. Okay, is there anybody else in the house? Uh, no. There's, there's a, there's a renter upstairs in the upstairs apartment. Okay, okay. When, where are you going now? I'm taking my granddaughter to my house on Olivewood. Okay, what's your advice? The side door is open. Okay. Okay? The side door is open on the house. Uh, 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 129, 29 okay. Clover. Do you know what kind of weapon? Yes, it's a Glock 40. A Glock 40? I believe so, yes. Do you know if he has any other weapons in the house? Yes, there's a, 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 a 22 rifle, a shotgun, and a... Where is that? That I don't know. Okay. Okay. And is, that an apart is that an apartment house? It, well, there's two apartments. There's okay. downstairs and upstairs. Okay. Two families. Okay. And what's your address on Olivewood? Uh, 1473 Olivewood. How old is your son? Uh, uh, I don't know. Okay. All right. What's his name? Jason. Same last name? Right, yes. Okay. He's not wanting to hurt himself or anything, is he? Yes, yes I, I think he is. The way the text is, yes. Okay, is he a substance did, abuse? He did, he did talk to me. He's on, he's on psych meds. Okay. Do you, okay, take a deep breath again and tell me how old he is. He's 38. Do you know what kind of meds he's on? No, I don't. Okay, but some kind, some kind of psych meds for his nerves and stuff. Okay, it's four two one six five seven seven. Is that his phone number? Uh, uh, I I don't know. Okay. I'd have to look it up. I, oh. I my phone is my memory on phones oh. anymore. Okay. All right. Can think hard for me and just think of what his birthday is. Uh, October twenty uh, third, I think. Okay. 40, so like 1980. And your granddaughter's okay? Yeah, she's fine. Okay. And are you up there? Yeah. Okay, All right, they're, they're both in the basement. Okay. Did he used to live on Imperial Avenue in Cleveland? Oh, uh, no. No, no, no. No, he lived on. Uh, uh, Ironwood? No, he lived on West 93rd. He lived in Lakewood. He's been, he's been in this house for uh, nine years. Ten years. Okay. The, uh, Did Ari just say he's secure? Okay, okay, we're out with him. So if you just go home, just sit tight there, and someone will be over to speak with you shortly, okay? All right. All right, bye-bye. Thank you. The police arrived at the scene of the crime and arrested Jason. During his interrogation, he said he lost it, and in court, his counsel tried to play off the murder as something that was not premeditated. But given the relationship issues he was experiencing with Stacy and the fact that he smoked a cigarette and covered Stacy with a blanket before shooting her, which he did that so his daughter wouldn't hear the shot, the court was convinced that Jason had actually planned to execute his wife. He tried to justify his actions by stating that ending Stacy's life was the only way to move forward, and that even if he had just gotten a divorce, the relationship would still weigh on him. He also said that what he did was in his daughter's best interest. In the end, he was sentenced to life in prison. On April 21, 2003, Amanda Marie Berry vanished right before she turned 17. Her sister was the last person to hear from her after Amanda called her to tell her she was on her way home from her job at Burger King. At first, the authorities thought she had run away from home. But a week after she went missing, a man called her mother with her phone and said that Amanda would be coming home soon. But Amanda would not be heard from again for 10 years. Tragically, Amanda had been kidnapped by Ariel Castro, a man with a violent history. His wife had left him due to his violent tendencies. 
She also got custody of their four children. Then, in 2003, Ariel offered Amanda a ride home. He had kidnapped another victim the previous year, and in 2004, he kidnapped a friend of his as daughter. Ariel kept his victims imprisoned in his basement and abused and took advantage of them for over a decade. What's surprising is that family often visited him and he would keep the basement padlock to preserve his dark secret. No one was ever the wiser. On May 6, 2013, Amanda thankfully escaped from captivity and sought out for help. She was with a six-year-old child. As soon as she got her hands on a phone, she dialed 911. You need police, fire, or ambulance? I need police. Okay, and what's going on there? I've been kidnapped, and I've been missing for 10 years, and I'm, I'm here. I'm free now. Okay, and what's your address? Uh, 2207 Seymour Avenue. 2207 Seymour. It looks like you're calling me from 2210. Huh? It looks like you're calling me from 2210. I can't hear you. It looks like you were calling me from 2210, Seymour. Yeah, I'm across the street. I'm using the phone. Okay, stay there with those neighbors. Talk to the police when they get there. Okay. Thank you. Okay, talk to the police when they get there. Okay. Hello? Yeah, talk to the police when they get there. Okay, I'm on the way right now. I need we're going to gonna send them as soon as we get a car open. No, I need them now before we get back. All right, we're sending them, okay? Okay, I mean, like, who's right the guy? Now? Who's the guy you're, uh, tra who's the guy who went out? Um, his name is Ariel Castro. All right, how old is he? Uh, he's like 52. All right, and, uh... Steven, I'm Amanda Berry. I've been on the news for the last 10 years. Okay, I got, I got that here. I already... <laughs> and uh, you said, what was his name again? Uh, Ariel Castro. And is he white, black, or Hispanic? I ain't Hispanic. And what's he wearing? I don't know, because he's not here right now. That's when, he he left, what, when he left, what was he wearing? It's a pity. What? Right, the police are on the way. Talk to them okay. when they get there. Okay? Huh? I need, okay. I told you they're on the way. Talk to them when they get there, okay? All right, okay. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Police officers arrived and entered Ariel's house with their guns drawn. One of Ariel's captives, Michelle Knight, embraced a police officer and kept on saying, You saved me. All captives were taken to Metro Health Medical Center after being rescued. Ariel Castro was arrested a couple of weeks later on May 6th and was charged with kidnapping and rape. His bail was set at $8 million. His legal representatives went on to say that Ariel was not the monster the media was portraying him to be, but was a man who deeply cared about the daughter he had fathered. But Ariel wound up pleading guilty to 927 out of the 977 charges brought against him. And yes, he's an evil, disgusting monster. Ariel was sentenced to consecutive life terms in prison with an additional 1,000 years. Given an opportunity to speak, Ariel said that he was a sex addict and his sexual relationships with his victims were consensual. He also suggested that the FBI should have caught him and that the girls shouldn't have gotten into the car with a stranger. On September 3, 2013, the world became a better place when Ariel ended his life in prison. Ten-year-old Zahra Baker was living with her father and stepmother in a rundown bungalow on 21st Avenue, Northwest Hickory. Their home had been visited on four different occasions over the better part of a year by social service officers due to repeated reports of improper discipline of the child. In spite of there being reports of Zahra showing up to school with a black eye, the officers never found taking any action to be necessary. That resulted in the closing of the case on the 6th of August, 2010, with no evidence of maltreatment or child safety issues having been found. Adam and Alyssa Baker married each other in his parents' front yard after having met online. He had a daughter, Zahra, from a previous relationship who had recently lost a leg due to cancer, but finally managed to beat it after an 18-month-long battle. Alyssa, on the other hand, was hiding six previous marriages, of which at least one was still in effect at the time of theirs, three grown-up children and a history of abuse. The newlyweds quickly moved to the United States, taking Zahra along and cutting ties with Adam's mother, Karen. 
This decision would later come back to haunt the Bakers as Alyssa's true self started showing more and more whilst Adam started neglecting his daughter. Statements later given by some of their neighbors paint a grim picture of what life had turned into for the young girl. Secret police, number one, where's your emergency? Uh, yeah, my daughter is missing. I'm sorry? Your my daughter, daughter is missing? Yes, ma'am. Okay, what's your address? 21, 21st Avenue, Northwest. The police were out here last night. Um, they were firing a ransom note for my boss's daughter. Um, I got up this, a little while ago, and it appears they took my daughter instead of my boss's daughter. Okay. How old's your daughter? She's 10. Um, she's handicapped. She has a prosthetic leg, so that... How long has she been missing? Um, we checked in there last night about 2.30 and she was there and all this happened last night about 5 o'clock so I don't know if they set a fire in the yard to distract us to go out and wouldn't they snuck in the door or I don't know. Okay, I'm not familiar with what happened last night. What happened last okay. night? Last night we were woken up. My dog woke me up and I had a fire in the backyard and somebody had put gas in my company vehicle that I drive for work. They left a ransom note on the company vehicle to my boss saying they had his daughter and his son was next. Um, and his daughter's fine. His daughter came with him here last night when I called him. And uh, it appears they may have taken my daughter instead of his daughter. They took his daughter. Okay, do you know who this was? I don't know who it was. That may have taken her? No, ma'am. Do you have any idea why, why they were threatening to take his daughter? I don't know. Okay, what's your name? My name is Adam Baker. And your phone number? Uh, okay, so no one has seen your daughter since 2 30 this morning? No, like I said, we uh, had all that drama last night and we, me and my wife went back to bed. And my daughter's, I think, coming into puberty, so she's hitting that broody stage. <laughs> so we only see her when she comes out, when she wants something, and that's about it. Okay, and, and did you say that she was handicapped? Yes, ma'am. She has a above the knee amputation. Okay, she has one... One leg, leg. Yes, that's partially amputated? Yeah, she has a prosthetic leg, which apparently they're taken with her. Prosthetic leg was taken with her? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and you don't have any idea at all? No, like I said, it was all addressed to him, and apparently it was all taken out on him, and I guess they thought he lived in his house. Okay, I'll stop my partner. Okay. 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 Did you talk to your boss about it? Um, I've just spoken to him, and he uh, told me to do that he's going to be here shortly. Okay. So, do you think that he knows? Um. We had an officer out here last night and he ran through who he thought may it may have been, like an ex-employee or something. Okay. And you said 21 25th Avenue Northwest? 21 21st Avenue, sorry. 21st Avenue. Yes, ma'am. 21 21st Avenue. Okay. Okay. Hold on just a second. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I see it now. I want to find the call. Okay. It was a uh, officer rolling. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. We're getting the police on the way out there. If you find out anything at all in the meantime before we get the officer out there, call me back. Anything okay. that would help us as far as finding your daughter. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Uh-huh. Bye-bye. Right. What Adam failed to mention is that his daughter had been missing for 15 days at the time he made the call on October 9th. He fixated on having found a ransom note on his work vehicle that was addressed to his boss. During police investigations, Alyssa admitted to being behind the note and the arson that came with it. She also confessed to the murder of Zahra, even taking the police to the same spot where she had buried her stepdaughter. Phone records placed Alyssa at the very places she took them on the 25th of September. 
leaving the question of how Adam could not have realized that his own daughter was gone for so long. The Bakers lived a rather harsh life when setting off for the U.S. together. At first they lived with Alyssa's father, only to get kicked out six months later due to what the father later suggested was Alyssa's substance abuse. Within the following six months they were evicted once again. Their landlady from the time described them as physically violent, mentioning that they were also constantly behind on rent. The family then moved to a trailer park in Hudson. Several of their neighbors from the time they lived there confronted the would-be parents on how the two mistreated young Zara. One incident, she was left with a neighboring family and hid in their bedroom when told her parents would be back for her shortly. Alyssa was found guilty of second-degree murder and was sentenced to 18 years in prison, but also received another 10 years for a drug conviction. Cameron Riemhofer received a call from his girlfriend of two years, Kaylee Sawyer, just after midnight on the 23rd of July, 2016. She asked him to pick her up from a friend's bachelorette party. After meeting up, the two had a fight in the parking lot of their apartment complex. It concluded with him entering the building while she didn't. Ten minutes later, he came out to check on her, but she was already gone. Their last contact was through the phone. Kaylee then told him that she was walking and that her battery was dying. At the time, 23-year-old Kaylee Ann Sawyer was studying at Central Oregon Community College, also known as COCC as well as working as a dental assistant. She was living with Cameron, but she also had friends and family all across Bend. Because of that, Cameron didn't think much of her walking into the night, but then he got in touch with Kaylee's mother and best friend the following day. Neither of them had heard from her. On top of that, her car was still parked in front of her friend's house. Only at that point did Cameron realize he had to call 911. Dispatch, how can I help you? Hello? Hi. Um, I'm not sure if this is quite the right number to call. Last night I got home from the bars with my girlfriend. She got upset at me and ran off. Mm -hmm. And I chased her and wasn't able to find her, and I still haven't heard from her. Her phone's off. I called all our family, and they haven't heard from her, so I'm wondering what you recommend I do. We can put in a call, and we can uh, have officers and deputies uh, look for her. Okay. And uh, where was she last seen at? Um, College Way. College in what? Um, Alpine Meadows Apartment Complex. It's like at the top of College Way. In that ap apartment complex? Yes. In a specific apartment or? In the parking lot. Just in the parking lot? You guys yeah, don't live there? Or? Yes, we live there together. Okay, what's the address? And what's the apartment number? And this is her address as well, the Aubrey Pine? Yes. Okay. And it was last night? Yeah. About what time? Uh, it was like 1 o'clock in the morning. They got walking or something? Like, she was mad? Yeah, I walked. She was, yeah, she was mad at me, so I walked inside and told her to come meet me, and then when she's like, calm down. And then I went back out in 10 minutes, and she was gone. And I called her a few times, and she said she was walking down the street. And then I guess she said her phone is about to die, and she, I couldn't get a hold of her after that. I haven't heard from her since. Okay. She took off on foot? Yes. What's her last name? Sawyer. S-A-W-Y-E-R? Yes. First name? Kaylee. K-A-Y-L-E-E. -E. And what's her date of birth? Um, March 2nd, 1993. And she's got her phone with her? Uh, she did last I saw her, but okay. it's been dead all day, and I for? imagine she would charge it. Um, let me look at my phone real quick. Sure. Do you know what carrier it is? Um, it is Verizon. And does she have a vehicle? Is it parked in the parking lot, or? She has a vehicle. It's parked at her friend's house. And I've been over there and talked to her friend, and she hasn't heard from her either. And the vehicle's still there? Yep. And what's the color, make, and model? It's a Subaru Impreza, and it's like a dark grayish blue. Do you happen to know the plate on it? Um, 
I don't. That's fine. And it's parked at a friend's house? Yes. Any idea where she would go or? Uh, I don't know. All the, I figured she'd go where her car was, her best friend's, or her mom's. And I've been over to both. Talked to her dad, and I just haven't heard anything from anybody knowing us. Okay. Does she go to, like, have a job that she needs to be out that she missed or anything or anything like that? Not today. She has work tomorrow at Aubrey Dental. Okay. And any diagnosed mental or uh, physical health issues? No, none that I know of. It turned out that Kaylee Sawyer bumped into what she quite likely took for a police vehicle and Edwin Laura, who was himself wearing a security uniform from COCC that closely resembled that of an official police officer. His car was a campus security SUV outfitted with plexiglass screens separating the front and back seats and auto-locking doors. He offered her a ride and she accepted it, most likely thinking that there was no reason to be suspicious. Her body was later found in a ravine in the vicinity of Redmond. The tragedy that began unfolding would not stop it claiming just one life, though. Without even delving into the trauma that her family, friends, and partners suffered due to the actions of an individual they knew nothing of until that point, Lara just began his spiraling descent. At first, he told a version of his story to his wife, who was a local police officer at the time. Then he drove off to California where he carjacked at least two vehicles, kidnapped a second victim, Andrea Elizabeth Mays, 19 years old from Salem, Oregon, and shot a man at a Super 8 motel. His crime spree went on for two days after his initial departure and finally ended with him turning himself in to the local police while on the phone with emergency services. The story didn't end there though as Sawyer's family filed a federal lawsuit against COCC in July 2017 on the matter of the striking similarities between the officer's kit and the vehicle of an actual police officer. Their attorneys undercovered evidence that not only were there red flags in regards to Lara, but also that the college's campus safety department knew of at least some of them. When all was said and done, he ended up with two federal life sentences. The Kent Hammers had been married for 25 years at the time the incident took place. They had a daughter and kept good relations with their close relatives. Barbara Kent Hammer, Todd's wife, kept a very tight schedule, calling her mother every morning before going to work, being exceptionally punctual in her professional life to the extent that her employer called her mother to ask if anything had happened to Barbara because she was two minutes late for her shift. Todd and Barbara are believed to have left their home at around 7.50 a.m. the morning of the accident. Despite Barbara having never been late for work and there being no evidence of her taking the day off, they were driving away from the school she worked at. Images of their car were captured by CCTV as they were driving out of town. Supposedly they were going together to replace the windshield on a truck though it was later found that neither of the people Todd claimed as his clients for the job arranged anything of the sorts. Todd called emergency services at around 8.30 a.m. on Friday the 16th of September 2016 from the M Highway, just out of Hamilton, Wisconsin. He told the operator that he and his wife Barbara were in a car accident caused by a pipe falling out of a flatbed truck and hitting their car's windshield. He claimed that the pipe hit her, and proceeded to follow the operator's instructions regarding CPR until authorities showed up at the scene. They found Todd in an agitated state and clearly nervous, wearing a blood-stained shirt. Hello? Oh, oh. Hi, this is the 911 center. You called me. I've got, yeah. I've got a new help now. Yes, hang on. I've got police and ambulance. First responders headed to Emmonburg and Cooley. I need you to tell me what happened. Slow down. <laughs> what? Did the car work? He jumped. Okay. And so your wife is injured? Yes. Okay. Yes. And there was in a car accident? Yes. A pipe or something came through a windshield. A pipe did. Pipe. Okay. All right. And I'm going to connect you to medical information, sir. What's your first name? Todd. Todd. Okay. And I... 
Um, I'm, they're going to help you help her until somebody gets there, okay? Hurry up. I, and then you're going to hear a dial tone in the phone ring. Just stay on the phone. And let me talk first when they pick up, okay? Mm hmm Okay, that's medication. Hi, this is Lisa, number one. I've got Todd on the line reference yes, that yes, accident at Bergen yes. in County M. Yes. He said a pipe or something came yes. through the windshield and yes. hit his wife. His callback number is the number on the header, 608-790-2360. So he needs Hello. some help with it. Go ahead. Okay, what can I do? Tell me exactly what happened. It, it, it got her and she's hitting the head and in the throat, I think, in the throat or something. She, she's got blood coming out of her nose and mouth and coming for her and big and blue. How old is she? 46. Is she awake? No, I can't get her to her. She talked that first a little bit. Okay. Is she breathing? No, I don't think so. No. All right, sir. We do have help on the way. Stay on the way. How long? How long? You're in the room. Sir, I want, you to stay, I want you to stay right where you're at, sir. Oh, yeah. I'm going to try to do something with this. Yep, we're going to... I'm going to put the phone down. I'm going to... Can you get her out of the vehicle, sir? I, I got her out. Okay, I want you, you to lay her flat out of the ground. I got her flat. I'm not going to stay, but I don't know what to do with this. Okay, listen carefully. I'm going to tell you how to do test compressions. Place the heel of your hand on her breastbone. Right yeah, between her nipples. I know how to do that. Right hand is top. I know how to do that. Pump the chest hard and fast. At least He's got blood coming second. out of his mouth. That's okay. Yeah. Go ahead and pump it twice per second and two inches deep, okay? Okay. All right. Put the chest down up all the way between the pump. I'll come back in a minute. Okay. Keep going, sir. Blood bubbling out of her mouth, bad. That's that's okay. That's okay. Mm -hmm. We're gonna keep keep pumping the chest hard and fast, okay? Pass out. Oh, I'm very you're doing great. Cool. You're doing just fine. Keep pumping the chest hard and fast, two inches deep. Keep going, sir. You're doing great. How far are they? Fine. They're, they're, they're are they? coming as fast as they can, sir. I know, but how fast are they? They're coming. I know, but I can't, I can't see them much longer like this. Yes, you can. You, you're doing a great job. You're doing what you can right now for her. She's putting out her ear, too. Okay. I think I hit her hard when she whipped around. Okay. That's okay. We're not hurting her at all right now. We're Come somebody that's fine. I don't know who you are. Okay. Just keep going. Okay, keep going, sir. I am, I am. Yeah, I'm coming. I am, they're coming. They're coming. You're doing great, sir. Keep going. Okay, I gotta hang out there. They come. There they come. Stay right, stay on the phone until you get right next to her. Okay, keep doing CPR. You're doing great, sir. You're, you're doing great. Just keep on going until they get right up next to her and they'll take over. I'm on the other side. I have to show them where I am. I have to show them. They'll find you, sir. You're doing great. Okay, they're here. I can't. Okay, make sure they come right up next to her. I got them. I can't. I got to get them. Okay. We want to continue with the CPR for her. They won't find me. They won't find me. Call them and tell them come back. They went past me. Okay. I'm on Virgo. I'm cool. We got some. Come on. Fuck me. Come on. Oh okay, so we got him turned around. Keep going. Keep going. Get him back here. Get him back here. Get him back here, huh? Yep, they're coming. 
I don't see them. Wait, which side of Bergham Coulee are you on, Todd? There's only one Bergham Coulee. No, which side of the road? You don't see my car. I tried to turn around. <laughs> Holy fuck. Are you hurrying? They're coming, Todd. Keep on going. The best thing we can do for her right now is to continue with that CTR. You're gonna be okay, Barb. You're gonna be okay. You're gonna be okay, Barb. You're gonna be okay. Where are you? You're gonna be fine as you're on scene, I know that. Hey, Barb. All right, sounds great. Thank okay. you. Yep, bye. Oh. Bye bye. Come on, come on. I'm gonna hurry up. She's pretty hard in that bad. I got her. Not on the road. Come on, man. Come on, man. The following day, Barbara took her last breath. Her passing resulted in the opening of a police investigation on the matter, with Todd as the main suspect. The news shocked the Ken Hammers family, but they never lost faith in Todd. The prosecution in the trial even had the bench right behind them reserved for family, but they all stood behind him until the very end. The investigation, and later on trial, took a number of unexpected turns. Todd's story proved iffy at best at several key points. Some of the biggest questions he couldn't answer were why were they driving away from Barbara's workplace while she was supposed to go to work? Why did he have shifts scheduled at work on the following weekend when he was supposed to be gone on a trip with Barbara? And how come his chest and neck were full of scratch marks while several of his wife's nails were broken and had traces of his skin under them? He got caught up in several lies and started throwing accusations at medical examiners, prosecutors, jurors, the media, and even law enforcement. Todd failed to convince the jury with his answers and was found guilty of first-degree intentional homicide. The verdict came down hard and swift. He was sentenced to life in prison at the end of his nine-day trial in March 2017 and is to be eligible for parole in 30 years at the age of 77. His family was still by his side even then, though he was not allowed to hug them before being taken back into custody to serve his sentence. 22-year-old Corey Moss and 24-year-old Stacy Hall were friends. They both had run-ins with the law. In February 2015, the authorities took Corey in on suspicions that he intended to sell marijuana. And in August 2014, police arrested Stacy after finding him in a car with a murder suspect from Illinois. Whatever Corey and Stacy were involved in led to a shooting at Stacy's apartment on February 9, 2015. Just eight days after Corey was arrested by the police who thought he wanted to distribute marijuana. Stacy's mother, Dawn Hall Porter, received a call while she was at work. She was told that her son had been involved in a shooting. Another son of hers picked her up from her workplace and together they went over to Stacy's apartment, only to find that nobody was there. The door was open and inside were two dead bodies. Both Corey and Stacy had been shot to death. Dawn immediately dialed 911. Gwinnett County 911, what is the location of your emergency? 1400 Harrington Road, Lawrenceville, Georgia. What apartment number? 5302. 5302? Yes. Okay. What's the phone number you're calling from, ma'am? 678. What's going on there, ma'am? I just found, I got a call at work that there was a shooting that my son was involved in, and I just arrived at this location. There's no police here, and they are dead in the apartment. You said they're dead? the police car, now it's gone. It's not a cop here, and they said the police was notified. Okay. I just left my job, and I come here, and the door is open, and then the end. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I am sure 
calling the police have been notified they are on the way. You said you they're dead in the apartment? They're dead. How many people? Right now I only see two. I didn't go all the way in, but my son is one of them. Okay. <laughs> what is your name, ma'am? My name is Dawn, D A W N. What is your last name, Dawn? H A L L hyphen P O R T E R. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Where are you at right now, Dawn? I'm standing in front of the building. <laughs> Once I, my son pushed the door open and we could see the bodies, and we turned around and called 911 because somebody called me at work and told me my son was involved in a shooting. <laughs> so I got my manager's permission to leave, and me and my son just came. They gave us the address and everything, and we just arrived here thinking the police would be here to find out what's going on. No cops are here. We go and knock on the door, but when he went to knock the door, pushed open, and you can see the bodies there. Okay. Is your son still outside with you? The this one is my other son that's with yes. me, but my, my other son is laying up there. And I've got paramedics and police both coming out there, I understand. Okay, and your other son's outside with you, though, right? Yeah, he okay. left his job in Alpharetta and came and picked me up because I was too hysterical to drive. And then I get here thinking that I'll find out what's going on, and there's no cops here or anything whatsoever. And I was informed that it was reported to the police. Yeah, then I gotta come and find you. Oh. Okay, it's an apartment five three zero two, correct? Yes, fourteen hundred Harrison Road, apartment five three zero two. Oh Jesus! I didn't think I'd have to find him this way. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. 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 Oh my Hello. All right, we're getting somebody to you, okay? But I'm going to keep you on the line until we have someone there, okay? And you're at 5302, is that apartment, right? Yes. And that's 1400 Harrington Road. Yes. Wesley Harrington Apartments, correct? Yes. Okay. So there should be somebody in there to you just a moment, okay? They're coming as quite fast as they Get can. Get to see <laughs> I don't believe this one that within the time that I got this phone call, you tell me no cops have been here, that anybody could just go up there, push the door open, and see these bodies laying there. <laughs> okay. okay, I do show they did have some officers on the area, but they weren't I see sure. the cars, but they're not pulling up here. They, he's turning around. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> with you? Yes. Yeah, okay. You to to no, him? you go ahead and you talk to the officer, ma'am. All right. Thanks. All right. Go ahead and meet sir. Thanks. All right. The authorities arrived at 9.50 a.m. The following day, they announced the news about the murders to the public. Investigators were keen on getting more information and encouraged those who had any to step forward. At that point in time, the authorities only had two leads. The first was a silver Ford 500 that was caught on a surveillance camera. The police believed this car was a getaway vehicle and the driver was a white woman. The second was a man called Jeremiah Barker who made a 911 call that very morning Dawn made one. The police suspect Jeremiah tampering with evidence. 
They also believe he was present when Corey and Stacy were killed. Despite this, they got nowhere with him due to the lack of evidence in the case. Over four years has passed and the authorities have still not cracked the case. Dawn had come forward to urge those who may have any information at all to step forward, but investigators still don't have a clue what happened, what led to the murders, and who the suspects are. On December 6, 2020, Jose Limas Maldonado was having lunch with Janice Ross at El Ranchero, a Mexican restaurant located next to Kennesaw State University campus. Jose was from Honduras and had immigration problems he had to sort out. His relationship with Janice was unclear, and sadly for her, while they were eating at El Ranchero, he took out a gun and shot her. The bullet hit her in the neck, Jose then ran away into the woods behind the restaurant. A few of the diners made 911 calls. He just shot somebody at this El Ranchero. What's, what's uh, the address here. there? What's, what's the address here? 562 Cobb Parkway. 562 Cobb Parkway. All right, stay on the line. Okay. All right, is it going to be north or south? I don't know. Somebody, what's the address? If I, north or south? I, I believe it's going to be, you said it's the El Ranchero, is that correct? Yes. Okay, what is your name? Yes. I, I, I'm, I'm on the phone. I know you're overwhelmed. Oh Can my you press for me? What is your name? I don't know where he went. No, okay, ma'am, ma'am, I need you to listen to me, okay? Ma'am. Uh, yes. I need to know exactly My name is, okay. I need to know exactly what happened. They were, uh, they were arguing and he, uh, he, somebody were shot. Arguing. Has somebody been shot? Yes. Okay. Yes. Where is, are you with that person shot. now? I, I, somebody else is over there with. I was all we were sitting there, and I was the only one that we saw it. Okay, all right. Take a deep breath for me, okay? Uh, okay. I'm getting help started. Oh my God. You're doing a great job. Where were they shot? I don't. I guess in the neck or the stomach. Like and you said it was a female, parent. right? Yes, it was a female. Okay, where is she currently located? She's sitting in the booth. Okay. In the, in the restaurant. She's sitting in the booth. Okay. All right. Stay on the line with me. You're doing a great job. What the? Did y'all want the booth? She's there. You're doing a great job. You're doing a great job. Are you are you next to her? No, she no no. Apparently, she she's deceased. You believe that she's deceased at this time? I believe so. All right. We should have units pulling up now. You're doing a great job. Just take a deep breath for me, okay? Yeah, they. Yeah, there's the police right there. Are the police pulling in okay, with you? Okay, the police is here. Okay. All right. Uh -huh. Let them take over. Take her to the patient, okay? Okay. You, you got an ambulance coming? Yes, ma'am. They're on their way as well. Okay. TV was just around the corner, so they've made it there faster. Okay. All, All right. right. Thank you. Uh-huh. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Hello, yeah. Somebody shot somebody here in the, in the Ranchero Mexican restaurant. I'm sorry? Huh? I'm sorry? What's going on? Somebody, uh, somebody choked, choked somebody here, one customer. Somebody choked somebody? Yeah, we need the ambulance. Okay, what is the, uh, um, what's the address? It's a 562 five, car park way south. Okay. It's El Ranchero, Mexican restaurant. Okay. All right, and what is... Somebody, huh? Okay, they're choking? Shoot. Somebody shoot somebody with, with, with a gun. It's an emergency. Okay, what is your name? Hobe. Oh. She, she's, she, she, she's, she's very bad right now. 
Okay, and you said that they choked him? Uh, somebody shot. Shot? Somebody shot, shot her? Uh, yeah. Okay. All right. He, he, he ran around. He's outside. He left. Uh, okay. But the lady is here. Okay. What is the suspect? What, what did the person look like? I don't know. They, they, they come together, but they, they, maybe they, they, they have problems and somebody, and she, he killed her and he left. I don't know. I don't know. Okay. Where's, okay. But I know she, she's here. Huh? Where, okay. The, okay. Okay. We need, we need, she needs an ambulance. Okay. We, we have an ambulance. We have officers coming. Okay. Where is the person that shot them? Is he on the boat? On the boat. He's he's on the bus. Oh, she, this is a no. restaurant. She, she, she was she used to there in the boat. Okay, I know. She's, yes, sir. But listen, the person that go. shot her. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. The police is here. The police okay. is here. Okay. Oh. All right. The police arrived within minutes, but Janice was already dead. At the same time, word of the shooting had spread around the university campus, causing quite a scare. The emergency department of the university cautioned the students about Jose and asked them to retreat to secure locations where they would be safe. The entire campus went on lockdown. A massive manhunt was conducted to track down Jose, who was eventually caught about half a mile away from the restaurant. He was hiding in buses, barely visible to the officers that arrived there, but a police dog sniffed him out and he was apprehended. Before booking him, he was taken to a medical center where injuries he sustained during his apprehension were treated. In his trial, the jury indicted Jose with murder, felony murder, aggravated assault, and possession of a firearm during the commission of a felony charge. By then, he had informed the police that he was in a relationship with Janice, but specific details of their relationship are unknown. I assume this case is still ongoing since it happened at the end of 2020, but it also has been a year. I couldn't find any results for it. Funnily enough, when I type in Jose Maldonado, Joe Exotic articles pop up. I guess his name's Joseph Maldonado. Fun fact, I didn't know that either. When Christopher McNabb met Courtney in 2013, he fell in love with her immediately. Four years later, the couple had a two-year-old daughter, and had just welcomed Kalia McNabb, their newborn daughter, to the family as well. Sadly, Christopher and Courtney's relationship was full of violence. They lived in a trailer that was unsuitable to raise children in, and to make matters worse, they were both meth addicts. Courtney was using meth while she was pregnant with Aliyah. After Kalia was born, she stayed with her grandfather for a few days before he returned her to her parents. When he arrived at the home, he saw the condition the trailer was in and asked Courtney to clean up the place. He did not know he was dooming Kalia to a violent fate by returning her to that home. On the 7th of October, Courtney dialed 911 to inform them that Kalia had been kidnapped. Eaton County 911, emergency. I just woke up. My dog woke me up on the couch. Um, I have a two-year-old and I have a two-week-old. And my, my two-week-old is not in her sleeper. Her pass is on the floor. She's not in her sleeper? I, she's not in her sleeper. She, she, she's not here. I've looked everywhere. I've looked under clothes and everything. What's your address, ma'am? Yes, lot 31. Do you think somebody took her, ma'am? My child said, my, my, my two-year-old says she's gone. And, and I've looked everywhere in the house, so I don't, I don't know another possibility. What lot number are you at? 31. Okay. And you said you were sleeping, woke up, and she was gone? Yes. My, my, my two-year-old came and woke me up. Okay. That's how it was on the count. Kalea! How old is she, ma'am? Two weeks old. Okay. And you, who else would have come in your house? I, I mean... As far as I know, nobody would have came in my house. My two-year-old says Papa, but I called my dad and I called my grandparents, and they don't have her. Okay. My dad's on the way here now. Okay. Uh, 
All right. How long have you been asleep? Um, the last time I woke up with her was around, I guess, five, maybe. Okay. So you were asleep since five o'clock? Yes. I didn't even mean to fall asleep on the you couch. I sat down for a minute after dealing with her all night. Entry, or can you tell if someone's been there? Is her blanket there or gone? Um, her blanket's gone. Her pasty's here on the floor. Her blanket's not with us. I don't know where. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I guess it's with her. Okay. And I have clothes and totes. But I've looked all in on it. She's not here. Is anything else missing, like a baby bag that she would that she would have, or anything else? No. Her bottle's here, on top of my shelf. Okay. What about no, it, 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 in my bathroom, on my vanity? I'm sorry. Ma'am. Huh? What about anything else that could possibly have gone, like could be hers that could have gone with it? Um, no, nothing else. Just her and her blanket. Okay, so the only thing is miss, that's missing is her and her blanket. Yeah. You didn't talk to the dad or grandma or anybody uh, else? Dad was here with me. Dad just left, and, and he's walking around the park looking for her. Because my two-year-old says, I asked her, did somebody come in and take her? And she said, yeah, but I don't, I, you know, she's two, so I don't know if right. I can believe right. that or, or not. Did you look through everything, like under the bed? Yes, the ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Leah. All right. What's your name, ma'am? Courtney Bell. C O R T N E Y B E L L. Just to let you know, Courtney, they've been on the way out there. I'm just getting this information to update them. Okay. Thank you so much. What's your phone number? Um, I'm not sure of this number. I, uh, my phone busted the other day. Um, okay. this is my grandmother's phone. She's been letting me use. All right, so you and the dad both were, I'm just trying to get an understanding so I can let them know because uh, of the questions that they're asking me. You and the dad both were sleeping or he just came back home? No, me and him woke up together. She woke us up together. Okay, okay. the two-year-old woke uh, y'all up and told y'all that the baby was gone? Yes. Okay. She, and he, he was kind of freaked out. I mean, it, I don't. I don't know. <sighs> Because she was just standing there beside the couch in the corner. And I told her, come here. And I loved on her. And then I told my baby's dad to go check on Kalia. And then he's talking about she's not in here. She's not in here. Okay. Well, the police should be in the area now. Thank you. Uh-huh. I'll go ahead and let you go, okay? Thanks. Uh-huh. The authorities found the 911 call suspicious and went over to Courtney's home to investigate themselves. They found the house in deplorable condition and suspected that Christopher may have had something to do with Kalia's unexpected disappearance. Three months after Courtney's 911 call, search volunteers found Kalia in a Nike duffel bag in the woods near the trailer park where Christopher and Courtney lived. When word got out of this, Christopher was in a car with Courtney. He jumped out of it and ran off. He was later caught at a gas station and charged with murder. New details began to emerge about the case as it gained nationwide attention, but nobody truly knows what happened in that house and who murdered Kalia. All that is known is that both parents were on drugs and Kalia died due to blunt force trauma to her skull. Both parents have vehemently denied murdering Kalia, but given the history of drugs and violence, it was agreed in court that Christopher was guilty of the murder, whereas Courtney was guilty of neglect. In the end, Christopher was sentenced to life in prison, and Courtney was sentenced to 30 years. Although it is clear that one of the two is the murderer, or maybe both of them, the case has resulted in a wide range of theories as to which one of Kalia's parents ended her life. Once again, I really do appreciate you taking the time to listen to this video. And if you're looking to find a little bit more about yourself and your family history, don't forget to click the link in the description and use code YOURMAKER for 50% off your first year subscription at MyHeritage. And good luck if you're looking for any family members like me. Mm -hmm. So as I said, I really do appreciate you guys taking the time to check out this video. This is another compilation of some of my, I wouldn't say favorite calls that I've covered, but some of the most interesting calls I've covered. There's still a lot more that I want to actually fix, but 
yeah, I figure we have so many new subscribers and stuff, they probably haven't heard a lot of these, so helps everyone out. I will catch you in the next video. And just remember, it's always scarier if it's true. Bad bye.